So our next panel uh, this afternoon is a panel that is going to address some of the key legal issues that are facing the crowdfunding industry, uh, recognizing this is a, uh, a new and emerging area. Uh, and um, so uh, there's a lot that we can all learn, I think, from these uh, three folks uh, to my left. Uh, in, in some respects, I think some have viewed the crowdfunding industry as a uh, a little bit of a wild, wild west uh, scenario. And I think uh, one of the things we've learned and will continue to learn as this industry grows is that's simply not true. Uh, so let me just uh, ask uh, the, uh, and again, we've got three people sitting to my left here who are you know, among the, the leading experts in the universe <laughs> in the area of crowdfunding. Um, we've got uh, Rick Weintraub, Jonathan Littrell and Lawrence Fassler, and I'll let them uh, introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their own uh, background. So Rick, why don't you get started? Sure. I'm Rick Weintraub. Good afternoon. I'm the Chief Compliance Officer and Legal Counsel and one of the four founders of Community Leader. Um, Community Leader provides software and services to operate white label portal that provide in the cloud uh, the offer and sale and subscription of securities. We have basically, our software and services could power every portal that's been up here today. Of course, we don't. Uh, we right now um, power about 25 portals with about 20 in the wings, so we are moving along. Um, our community leader was built on compliance. That's the reason I'm involved as a securities attorney. We were built on providing our software to be fully compliant with all SEC rules and regulations and FINRA rules and regulations, and in fact, we met uh, with FINRA and SEC. We've offered them a seat on our platform, which they have not accepted, but we said you could have it. And the reason being is when somebody is audited, not when, when they are audited by a State Securities Commission or the SEC, FINRA, you want to be able to give them an experience of an investor who made a complaint from the time he signed on to that current moment to hopefully show that there was no efficacy in their claim. And the reason to do that, as you all know, if you're investigated, even if you're 100% clean, the longer that investigation goes over, the more you're potentially out of business. My background before this and concurrently is I'm a securities attorney for over 30 years, and I've been lead counsel on over 400 public and private offerings. Okay, thank you. Jonathan? All right, uh, Jonathan Luttrell. I'm uh, counsel to Asset Avenue. Uh, my background also is in securities uh, and corporate compliance. Um, Joined up with Asset Avenue in April, and we do, I don't know if those of you are not familiar with it, but we do uh, lending uh, more on the peer-to-peer -peer side in commercial real estate. So we have a, a foothold in, re in real estate, but it's on the uh, loan side, then on the debt side, not on the equity. Um, again, what, what we're, our, our focus is really on the uh, making sure there is compliance, and, and as Rick pointed out, the, the regulatory regime is, is growing, and uh, we're, we're there to kind of help shepherd along. I'm Lawrence Fassler with Realty Mogul. Uh, we've, you've heard a little bit about us already today. Um, our stature, I think, is one of the leaders in the crowdfunding industry. We're pretty proud of uh, on some of these issues, the legal issues that are coming up. Uh, we've kind of been on the exploratory forefront as much as anyone, I think, in trying to figure out what the SEC wants or what other regulators might think of crowdfunding generally. So that's been an interesting experience. My own background is uh, uh, went to law school in Columbia University, worked in New York uh, for Sherman Sterling and in Silicon Valley for Cooley Godward for some time, and then was general counsel for a medical device company up in Northern California. Uh, and then recently, I was working more with a, a real estate company itself until joining Real, Realty Mogul, and uh, it's all been uh, one big fun ride since then. Okay. okay, well, let's, start, let's get started talking about some of the, uh, the legal framework that governs uh, crowdfunding generally. Uh, and uh, the, um, I think one of the first uh, topics I'd like to get, uh, get out to the panel is uh, sort of the uh, rule, rule 506C, how that compares to Rule 506B. Uh, and let me just ask uh, Rick if you wanted to uh, start talking about that. Okay. Most of you are aware of 506B. It's the old line, uh, Reg D. It's uh, compliance with Section 4A2 of the Securities Act as a private placement. We've all done it in this room probably, all familiar with it. Um, it became unworkable for two reasons. 
One, anybody who's worked with Reg D 506B before, it's a herding cats mentality of attracting investors. Um, and secondly, there was no general solicitation and advertising permitted to bring investors on into you unless you had a pre-existing substantial business or personal relationship with an investor. And we could go through how that was developed, and there's probably more times it was de developed improperly. When Title II of the Jobs Act was passed, it provided two key elements. One was basically the codification of no action letters to create on online platforms to conduct Reg D offerings. And the second part of it was to permit general solicitation. Um, and which, of course, except for the pre-existing business personal relationship, had not been available in the past. Um, at Community Leader, we've set up a system to use general solicitation and how it works, which may be different than some of the portals because we're very conservative. Um, essentially, what we will have is an issue will come onto a portal that we would support, and they would probably send out a teaser email. We are conducting an offering. Uh, we're going to raise $3 million. If you're interested, click on this hyperlink. The hyperlink would go to an advertisement, a general solicitation. Um, there's a Rule 509 that's been proposed. Uh, this rule sets forth certain requirements that should be contained in an advertisement. Essentially what it is is a tombstone on steroids with certain restrictions and caveats that the SEC has prescribed. And once you go on that and you want to go to the next, then you get into the portal, you sign into the portal. So that's the aspect of general solicitation and how it not work, only works but doesn't work in the abstract, works in the uh, immediate uh, portal uh, uh, complex. You also have the vetting out of the securities, and maybe one of the other guys wants to, how do you vet out an accredited investor mm -hmm. and go into that? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take that. So, so basically, when you, going back to the 506B and the 506C, um, with respect to the, I think, I think you may have mentioned it, but I, I want to make it, there's a clear that there's, when you have that pre-existing relationship, what that relationship is, is to establish that there is, that the investor is an accredited investor. So you have to have, and what, what they use in 506C is a reasonable basis to, to believe the, the, that the investor is a, an accredited investor. 506B is that relationship. So for example, if your friend who is sleeping on your couch were asking you if they can invest, probably not meeting that standard of accredited investor because you have that relationship and you know that they are probably not a high income individual. Uh, alternatively, 506C is not a self certification, it's the actual offer, offeror who is, who is basically looking and certifying whether or not that investor is accredited. So that's kind of the difference, I think, on a, on a grander scale of the two. Um, and so obviously that allowed, that opens up the window for general solicitations because you can say, hey, anybody come apply. And then once you apply, you provide me with certain information and then I can figure out whether or not you are accredited. I don't need that pre-existing relationship which, oh. as you pointed out, the pre-existing relationship is a little clunky because there is no defined box of what that relationship is. Well, let me just ask, if you don't have a pre-existing relationship, how do you determine whether the investor is accredited? So, so well, so some of, uh, you mean on 506C? 506C, so where it's your ways, responsibility. There's, there's stated ways, and I think you mentioned this as well, with respect to, there's, uh, you can, I, th I believe it's to review financial statements, you can have an independent third party do that as well. Um, you can get letters from accountants and lawyers saying that the individual is accredited. Uh, and I think, was there any other ones that are? I think you, there's, there's two other ones. There's two other um, ones. An investor will have to show that he meets the income test, which right. is the $200,000 in the last two taxable years, and in the current year he expects to make $200,000. To prove that you've done it in the last two years, you have to provide some sort of tax return, either a 1040, um, a, a right. K1, a 1099, something to show that. And then you have to also upload a declaration that says I expect to be there in the current year. The second way of doing it is to prove out your net worth. And the way they want you to do that is to upload cash and security statements to show that you have a million dollars net worth exclusive of your home and also send in your credit report with a declaration this is my current credit report. Both incredibly onerous. The third way, as Jonathan was saying, is that you can have a trusted advisor certify that you're accredited in a declaration within the last three months. Again, somewhat cumbersome. A community leader, we've done something different. Um, we have a seamless 
um, connection with a company that actually, when somebody subscribes, it'll automatically go to that company. And if somebody's in their system and has been accredited within the last three months, we'll get a green light. If they're in their system, but they haven't been accredited in the last three months, we'll get a yellow light, an email goes out automatically and says we need additional information to be submitted to this, this service. And if they're not in the system, there's a red light that goes on, another email goes out and basically says, here's the information we need to make sure that you're accredited. So we have somebody else who takes the liability, but it's seamless on our, uh, on our portals. To us at Realty Mogul, I think that's kind of been the biggest difficulty is the, it sounds maybe not so difficult, oh, you just get a few financial statements from people, but in fact, if you ever try to get someone's bank balance, you know, from a, a guy who's a credit investor, it's like pulling teeth. It's, mm -hmm. People don't want to give up that information, and it takes a little while to really get things processed. It, certainly the one offering that we did that was mentioned before, the Hard Rock Hotel, it went well enough that we got it done, but it, it really kind of slowed things down. And for us, that's a bit of our hesitancy to do too many more of those because what we want to, where we want to be is a crowdfunding like it sounds, technology oriented, things happen automatically. This is all you do is push buttons and it's done. We haven't been able to figure out how to fully automate things on the 506C level. As Rick mentioned, there are some preliminary steps, some early providers. If you have someone in your system from a few months ago, you're all set. But getting that first round of verification from people is still a little bit difficult. There's also the potential to miss a lot of investors who otherwise would qualify because, as you know, when you file your tax returns, the idea is to reduce that number as much as possible, not increase that number. So folks who would otherwise qualify sometimes don't just based on what their tax returns actually say. Okay. Well, we've been talking about 506C. Let's uh, move forward and talk about some of the options that are available under Title III and how those compare to uh, 506C and other, uh, and other options and how that works. Uh, who'd like to talk about that? Rick, you want to take a st well, get a start on that? Well, community leaders started out potentially as being um, in the, in the, fi in the uh, Title III area. And we developed our software initially for equity crowdfunding before we got into it. Uh, show of hands, who knows about equity crowdfunding? Just a few. We should raise our hands. Okay. <laughs> As you guys are probably aware in the past, you want seed capital for a small deal, who did you go to? A gray market consultant who wasn't a registered broker dealer. You went to some angel group that took nine months to look at it and get their angels together to invest. You went to friend families and fool's rounds. Uh, you went through all of these things that were just very uh, difficult to deal with. Equity crowdfunding is a exemption from registration under section four. Uh, which is where Reg D is, uh, comes from. And basically it's saying you can raise a million dollars per issuer in a rolling 12-month period. In real estate, for the smaller real estate projects, you know, the duplexes, the fourplexes, things like that, that you want to do it, that might be ample to go raise in an equity crowdfund. Uh, there's some peculiar uh, provisions of equity crowdfunding. One is who can invest. And they divide into two striations. One, people have less than an income or a net worth of $100,000, the most they can invest is 5% with a floor of $2,000. And if they're over $100,000, they can invest the greater of 10% of their net worth or income, which is ever greater, um, but up to $100,000. So you have that, and they self-certify that. You know, so you don't have to go out and vet them out. They self-certify that they're at that. What equity crowdfunding has brought into the lexicon is a new animal, which is an intermediary, which is described as a funding portal, but the funding portal could be a FINRA broker dealer also. And this funding portal is the one is going to maintain, file, uh, record everything that happens in a particular offering. So you're going to have that funding portal, and then you're going to have the issuer who has certain requirements that they have to make. Essentially what happens is there is a scaled down XML form, called Form C, that's filed with the SEC when we get that far, uh, given to investors that gives basic information about the offering with exhibits attached, uh, much less than a PPM. Um, legal costs are supposed to be minimized as much as possible, and that will be submitted to the SEC and to an investor, and there's a 21-day cooling off period before you can start accepting money. But essentially, this is going to be something that's offered to the crowd. 
It's mostly it's going to be people who are unaccredited, mostly people that are investing from their self-directed IRAs, mostly investing under $2,000 per. So you could be sitting there getting 500 to 1,000 people invest through equity crowdfunding. And that's what the magic of, the, of it is, is to be able to go out to everybody and have them invest in a particular um, company. And it's not just for startups. In fact, it's not going to be mostly for startups. It's going to be a lot of existing emerging growth businesses that need capital that don't have enterprise value. Uh, you're going to see a lot of companies um, that are in real estate that have the small project that they want to get the seed capital for it. Um, so it's going to be an incredible tool that's going to be used um, when and if it's passed. And we hope it's sometime this year. They proposed regulations last October. Um, the comment period was over in February, and we're expecting rules sometime in final form this year. And let me um, move, just move to the next uh, the discussion about a, uh, Reg A and A plus and what that you know, could, could mean. And I'd like to get your perspective about uh, you know, what's likely to come out of the, uh, rate, the um, rulemaking process and how it will affect the future of crowdfunding. Sure. The, so, so basically, as we mentioned, the, the Reg A, uh, it's, it's got a limited right now amount that you can raise. Um, through the through the site or through a, a portal, uh, you're still subjected to blue blue sky off or blue sky laws. So, the concern there is if you go out and you raise, let's say a million dollars, but that million dollars comes from 100 investors in 40 states, you're still subject to each of those states with respect to whatever requirements there are. The 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 new uh, A plus that's out or coming out, obviously increases the raise and then it it, it will potentially exempt the blue sky offering, which is a really, really big uh, piece of this because it's, it could be extremely cumbersome to track back through, okay, where'd all my investors come from? I mean, New York even has a pre-solicitation rule uh, and, and complying with that in crowdfunding would really, really pretty, pretty much inhibit what uh, Rick was talking about, which is kind of the ideal scenario where you can go out, you put your, your, uh, you know, your prospectus up on a site and you can raise capital uh, from the actual crowd. Yeah, my own understanding is that the states are still fighting this quite yep. a bit, which is the reason why we haven't really seen the rules finalized in this respect. To, to have some merit reviews, to you really to be able to give a yay or nay over the quality of an offering, it's some power, and it's reluctant for them to give up that power. And they don't have it in the regular 506B uh, situation. Right. And this is one where they feel the federal government encroaching on them again, and they're a little reluctant. To, they to also little charge better. fees, too. So. And, they, and they get some fees. <laughs> it's a revenue yeah. generator for them, so they're going to fight it. Can I add a little bit Yeah, to go it? ahead, Rick. Uh, most of you guys have dealt with REITs in the past, private REITs. Um, they might, they're not publicly traded. They could be publicly traded. But they're private REITs with a lot of restrictions, a lot of rules as to distributions. I foresee Reg A plus being a boon to real estate developers and syndicators. You're going to be able to raise up to $50 million in an offering. Um, you're going to have to provide audited statements for the last two years, but they're not PCAOB. Auditors, you're going to have to file with the SEC for approval. Again, it's an XML form, uh, so it's a, a different. It's a lot easier than doing an S-1 registration statement. You're going to have to file to the extent you have compensation through a broker-dealer with FINRA to approve the compensation structure. But you're going to be able to sit there and do basically non-specified property offerings. With one caveat, today the asset-backed securities rules under Dodd-Frank were released by the SEC. I read them briefly. I'm not quite sure how they're going to cross over to this. So um, that's the one caveat I have this, and I'm going to reserve comment on that. However, if you put it together, you're going to be able to do that. You'll comply with the Investment Company of Act of 1940, which has a real estate investment exception. Um, and you may have to comply with the investment, the investment Advisors Act of 1940, which says you might have to be a registered investment advisor if you do anything more than just fee interest in real estate in your fund. Mm -hmm. But this is going to be, I believe, one of the biggest boons of it. There will be what we call master limited partnerships, which means limited partnerships or LLCs that will file with the SEC, have potentially, they could be free trading. Most of you won't have them free trading orig originally, but they could be free trading if you want them to be and get a market maker. And I think it's going to open up another avenue for capital that's going to be huge. Does, uh, does anyone on the panel want to hazard a guess? as to when, uh, if ever, we're going to get the Reg A plus uh, 
uh, promulgated and have it be effective, or is it just one of these great mysteries that will uh, be resolved when Washington, in its infinite wisdom, uh, decides <laughs> it's time to get these regs out? Yeah, there are a lot of competing interests still finding right. out this. And same thing with Title III. I mean, the, the reason the mom and pop crowdfunding still hasn't happened is I think the SEC is awfully reluctant to go there. Sure. They just see widows and orphans getting messed up and all the dour scenarios you can imagine. They really did not like this rule in the beginning, and I think we're continuing to see that reluctance. Yeah. There's been a change out at the commissioner level, still not much change. So. I think we'll see Title IV before Title III regulations. Right. And as far as the states making a stink, they made the same stink in 1998, 97, 98, mm -hmm. when we came out with the idea of covered securities and Reg D, yeah. that the SEC was going to preempt the field because there were all these unusual um, laws, state blue sky laws that were regulating the area. They made it very difficult to access capital. Mm -hmm. And I believe even though the state commissioners are making the same beef, the SEC is better equipped to have one uniform law and one application so that we can raise capital. And the whole idea about the JOBS Act was to turn the ability of Main Street, not Wall Street, Main Street to raise capital and to make it easier. And I think eventually the states are going to succumb. The SEC is going to preempt them like they have recommended in their rules, and we're going to see them before the end of the year. All right, well, let's, um, let, let's turn uh, away from some of the, uh, just the basic regulation structure and uh, discuss some of the uh, other legal issues that face uh, crowdfunding entities. And uh, I wanted to start uh, by asking, um, and I'm going to ask you, Lawrence, this question to get started about broker-dealers. What's the uh, relationship between crowdfunding platforms and broker-dealers? Uh, is, uh, you know, is it important to have an affiliation? Can the platform itself be a broker-dealer? Or how, how, do you, how do you view those issues? It depends how the securities that you're issuing are structured. Uh, for Realty Mogul, on the debt side, we are issuing our own securities, or debt securities of Realty Mogul. People aren't really getting a participatory, a participatory interest in the loan itself that we are making to the borrower. We are making that loan, but then on the other side, we are issuing debt securities of a Realty Mogul to the investor. And so in that case, there's an issuer exemption. We're not brokering or dealing for anyone, so there's no real need for a broker-dealer. On the equity side, though, we set up a separate LLC, a separate limited liability company for every single project investment that we organize. And in that instance, you're starting to deal in, or broker for another entity. If you want to take transaction-based compensation, you really need to align yourself with a broker-dealer. And it doesn't necessarily have to be partnering with a broker-dealer. You can become one yourself. And I think in the end, most people in this space are going to end up becoming their own broker-dealers, as we've seen in some of the startup uh, crowdfunding spaces as well. So that's, that's certainly out there because it's, a, it's not the most efficient use for, uh, for Realty Mogul, I imagine most people in this space, to align with a third party broker dealer. There's some advantages in getting up to speed on this area of the law because FINRA can be pretty detail oriented in what it expects to see from people. But it's, you know, they're, they're taking a cut, uh, they're slowing things down when it comes to review of advertising materials. It's not. We appreciate our partner, but uh, in the end, I, it's not the most efficient way to go. But that's really the, the, the gist of it. If you want to take transaction-based compensation, which means a placement fee on the amount that you're raising, uh, you're going to have to figure out a, a, a space in your life for a broker-dealer. Yeah. You are treating your debt securities as securities? Yes. Or your debt interests as securities? Yes. Okay. And I, I, mean, I don't want to be contrarian, but I was going to ask the question. Um, are you receiving any compensation in connection with the placement of those? Uh, no. no I'm spread. not talking about the commission, spread. but any compensation. There's a spread on what we charge to the borrower. Okay. And what it's we it's just do. interesting because... But nothing really from the investors themselves. One of the things about Title II and the electronic platform that was in there, it goes through a bunch of rules that says what you have to do to be exempt from filing as a broker-dealer. It's not an exclusion, it's an exemption, just like an RIA is a broker-dealer, but they're exempt from going through full compliance. One of these platforms in Title II is the same thing. And what it says is they're prohibited from taking compensation, not just transaction-based compensation, which is commissions or a fee that's paid if, it's, if the deal, if the deal, the raise occurs and is completed. It's any sort of compensation 
except for that compensation that fits into two pigeonholes. One is a due diligence fee, and one is a document fee. You know, so um, it's written a little differently, and a lot of people don't realize it's not just limited to transaction-based compensation, it's limited to any compensation. So anybody who goes into this has got to be careful. It's my opinion that a portal cannot do a 506C platform without having a broker-dealer affiliated to it. But, but there are a lot of folks out there that are doing it, right? They just haven't been caught yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, somebody hasn't lost money yet. <laughs> and and for, for, you know, for, for lawyers, that's just uh, music to our ears, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I think someone in the crowd had a point there. I think the real estate industry in general for a long time has kind of considered itself an animal apart. And their syndications, they don't really consider those securities. And since, for the most part, they were pretty private, private placements as it was, there wasn't too much concern. On the crowdfunding level, of course, we're really getting securities out to a mass of people, and the whole game has changed, and I think it's causing, a, right. causing people to refocus on the intersection of real estate law and securities law in the way that hadn't happened before. There was, actually, along that line, just recently, there was a case in the Ninth Circuit here that basically said even general partnerships can be securities. They have a three-part test that it wouldn't be a security, but the SEC is very, very stringent on whether you meet that three-part test, and there have been some strange results on whether or not joint, joint ventures or general partnerships are securities. Well, in, in some ways, these, these issues and the, and the broker-dealer issue leads us to uh, the next question I wanted to ask the panel about um, establishing a new portal. And Jonathan, I wanted to right. ask you to get us started on that. Uh, what are some of the legal issues that are involved with Starting a new portal sure. uh, in you know, licensing. Should you should uh, if you're interested in forming a new portal, is it important to get insurance? Right, right. I think it's an, it really important though to make a distinction just off the bat of establishing a portal and or trying to raise capital for a deal. Um, I think you know some folks in here. It seems like maybe sponsors, equity sponsors. You're going out and you're going to want to try to raise capital for a deal. Now you'll sometimes see that you'll, if you were to go at your own and, and create a, a way of doing it through your own sites, then you're in, in essence creating a portal. But when, when I'm speaking of a portal, it's creating a site through which other folks can come to you and then crowdfund through your site. Um, much like you were mentioning with, with Realty Mogul on the, on the equity side. Um, and so it is, as Rick was pointing out, there's, it's definitely there's significant regulation with respect to it. Whether or not you need to register as a broker dealer, I think is still, somewhat out there, I, I definitely lean toward your response that you're, it's obviously a wiser choice to do that, uh, to either affiliate one with one, um, because we don't actually know how the SEC is gonna come down and interpret uh, Title II yet. Um, and then you can also do what's basically a lower level than that, which is registering your portal uh, with the SEC and FINRA itself. Um, that again, they have a, I think it's a, it's still in form uh, version of what you have to fill out, you basically fill out a form and you send it in uh, to FINRA and it provides a lot of information. Um, the, with respect to the, th then, then it, it leads to the next question because it's a very broad question of what kind of registration is required. The next thing is, well, what are you actually doing on that portal? As an example, I mean, if you're raising capital to be a lender, you're gonna have to go look and see what kind of lender licensing requirements there are in each state if you're doing that. So it's gonna be somewhat business specific as well. Um, but I think if you're gonna write down two of the biggest words there, it's, it's the dealer registration or the portal registration, you wanna definitely look at that. Um, as far as the, the time it takes, again, it's gonna be somewhat specific on the type of offerings that you're doing. So if you're doing 506B or 506C, you wanna make sure that it is, some may be a little bit longer as far as the lead time, 506B, figuring out, okay, how do I market this thing without marketing this thing? That's a very tricky thing to do. Um, 506C, who, how am I gonna go about getting an investor's information uh, and what are the protocols that I'm gonna to use to make sure I don't mess this up? Because the last thing you wanna do is let an unaccredited investor through that wall, basically. Um, Again, if you're gonna register uh, your portal, you're gonna, there's gonna be a number of controls that you wanna get in place. I think there's a, there's a $100,000 bond you're gonna need as well for a portal. Um, and with respect to controls, they're internal controls. So anti-fraud is a good one. That if you have your uh, certain sponsors coming onto your site to raise capital, what kind of protections do you have in place for your investor? If you're gonna go out and say, okay, I think this is a good investment, 
uh, or at least good enough to get onto our site, whether or not you say it, you want to make sure that that individual is actually real, they exist, they have a track record, uh, and they're not just going to abscond with your investor's money. Um, there's additional reporting requirements. So it's, it's, I can go on for a long time, basically. It's significant, and Rick's definitely nodding his head. And I think that's one of the things that your uh, site helps with, right, is well, that? I mean, I could, from an operator standpoint, we go in a lot of times to people who are trying to develop their own software and services to run a portal. No problem putting up a website. No problem looking pretty. Where the problem arises is writing compliance software and how much that costs. We have over a million dollars in our software alone. I think it might be close to a million and a half. Joseph Barasanzi, our CEO, is somewhere out there and knows better than I do. But we have a significant amount of money and it's taken us a long time to write it to be compliant. Uh, we've had portals come to us who have tried and they've spent two, three, four hundred thousand dollars. They've given up and says, you guys do it. Can we license your software and services? And the, the biggest thing that I have seen from portals and developing, again, it's not the front end, it's the back end. And you look at analytics. Let's say, for instance, you're a real estate developer and somebody comes up there and says, I only got a 10% return. You've promised me a 40% return. In our software and services, we can give an examiner, SEC, whomever, a CD, a PDF file, or access to the, to the site within moments. And they can access the experience of that investor from the date he signed on an investment to that current minute. And it will show everything he did. So if he went to page 13 of the PPM that says, we're only going to give you a 10% cash to cash return, and you read that and you're on that page on January 15th for five minutes at this time, that analytics is basically going to dispense with that investigation. And that's what we offer to our portal operators, that ability to combat that. Right. Yeah, I agree that uh, throughout the process, there's really a lot of verification, and especially of people's accredited status. The, the, the old way where you knew someone, you were introduced from the, the, your attorney or investment advisor to a potential sponsor, uh, and you had a chance to, to develop a real pre-existing relationship, just doesn't exist in the mm -hmm. internet crowdfunding context. So for Realty Mogul, for example, for someone to say that they're an accredited investor, it really happens like four or five times throughout the process. When they first sign up, they get another email to confirm. When they actually invest, they're asked another two times. Salespeople are on the phone within 48 or 72 hours, maybe if it's a weekend, trying to reach them in person and walking them through, among other things, oh yeah, and how are you accredited? Just to really verify that all that happens. And then same thing on the sponsor front, like I think we were mentioning before, you really do have to run background checks and, and criminal and background checks, and really credit checks too, just to make sure. Because for us anyway, we're dealing with, dealing with people across the country. So a few people uh, in this room actually, and people who just presented in the last panel we knew before, we had some working relationship with, other people, we can get the idea of their track record, but you really need to, to do some vetting up front to make sure you stay out of trouble. Right. And one other thing that is kind of a little bit of a culture shock, I think, to folks who, because a lot of people, I think, are coming in, crowdfunding, it's a new, you know, exciting world. Um, let's, you know, they kind of take a startup mentality to it, and, and they put a lot of dollars toward their marketing, or, and, and you're, there's going to be a huge clash right off the bat between the marketing side. Uh, and kind of the legal side, whether it's your inside or outside legal counsel. Um, it's, it's, it's a total switch in mindset. And I'll take, uh, as an example, uh, uh, individual in the marketing department, I said, oh, you know, we got to put, I, I don't remember what it was, it was a FICO score of a borrower or something, and I said, you know, we got to put that. Well, that doesn't look very good. <laughs> and I said, that's exactly <laughs> the flip of, of what I'm trying to say. If it doesn't look good, you want to put it down there. Those are the things. It's not going to sell it. It's, it's you're disclosing the information. You're not selling it. Uh, and so that's, I think, a little bit of a culture shock that you'll find if you were to start up uh, your own portal and you're bringing in folks who may not have that financial regulatory background. Well, let me... Uh turned a couple narrower questions, or unless, Jonathan, do you have more you want to say about sure. the, the uh, you want to ask me about the insurance, or? Uh, well, yeah, why don't you briefly okay. comment uh, on that? Narrow, you yeah. know, I think that's a. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're going to get insurance, which obviously highly recommend that you do, um, and I've actually been on the phone with the folks at AIG, at Hartford, you name them, the big, the big ones, and I think a lot of uh, the crowdfunding funding portals, from what I'm hearing, is they're having difficulty getting insurance, getting the DNO and ENO insurance. Uh, there is a major, major, and this is in my discussions with the insurance carriers, shift away from the word crowdfunding. 
uh, they don't like it. Um, they're concerned with it. It's new, they don't know. Like, as we're saying, we don't know where the SEC is gonna go. Insurers are saying, there's my dollars going out the door. Because they don't know who's gonna be, you know, that they're insuring, who's gonna get dinged and who's not. Um, so they wanna make sure that, that you're, what, if, if you are quote unquote crowdfunding, you have some serious backend uh, controls and platforms uh, and reporting requirements already built into your system. So the more that you can build that out before you get on the phone with them, the better. Um, also, they don't like low minimums, uh, which you know we see low minimums potentially as a, as a way to get investors in, but also you don't really want your investors putting all their money into one deal potentially. You'd rather have them spread that out. So it really helps them from a risk perspective. Insurance, the carriers do not like it, or at least the underwriters do not like that. They, they are concerned with the amount of money going in, and obviously the lower your dollar amount, the more likely it is that an investor is unaccredited. Yeah, it's something that affects the whole Title III dynamic. I think even if it is approved, eventually it'll be interesting to see how many people in this room or in this industry turn to kind of mom and pop crowdfunding. Uh, as Jonathan said, it's really attractive. You can advertise to or bring it, bring in potentially a whole new market of people who weren't able to invest in these things before. Um, but as Jay Kerner, I think, in the last panel mentioned, and a couple of people here probably feel. Not sure you really want to deal with unsophisticated people. You may just want to limit yourself to accredited investors who have had some ups and downs in their business life before. They understand maybe if an, invested, an investment may not go south, but maybe it's going sideways, they understand because they've got three others that are going up. That's how life works. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy who just starts crowdfunding for the first time in his life and puts up the maximum p possible, you know, you may have a lot more legal liabilities in the mm -hmm. end. Right. dealing with that kind of customer, and I think that's the insurance company's sensibilities as well. Well, mm -hmm. thank you for that. The, um, we have a couple minutes left. I want to save a couple minutes for questions as well. But let me ask, and, and let me start with you, Lawrence. Um, wh where do you see uh, the um, changes in the future happening, either on the legislative side, regulatory side? What's the future for the uh, legal structure under which uh, crowdfunding uh, platforms and sponsors are going to be operating? Well, it would be interesting to see, as we talked about, how Title III plays out once that is uh, approved in some form or another, how that really has a practical effect and how many people adopt it and how many don't. I think for us, it's a little bit, uh, we're a little bit limited, practically speaking, uh, because as, uh, as we mentioned here earlier, you're, you're limited to raising a million dollars each year, or each issuer it can only raise a million dollars each year. I think the advice we've gotten is that, well, you know, each limited liability company we're setting up is strictly speaking the issuer, but uh, they're liable to hold that $1 million limitation to, to us, Realty Mobile. And frankly, each of our raises is a million dollars or more. So it's not clear how much we're really going to be able to take advantage of that if and when it happens. I think the more pressing issues for us in the existing regulatory regime, the 506C verification procedures that we spoke about really are a bit of an imposition. It's a great development that you can advertise to the world. We've noticed a huge bump up in traffic and new registrants when we had the Hard Rock offering on our site. Um, but the verification procedures were you know, a chore to get through. And if there was a way to lighten up the regulatory regime on that, that would be a welcome development. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, the other thing for us, we mentioned before the kind of pre-existing relationship that you always had to have under private placements generally. And, and uh, you don't need as much of 506C, but if you're gonna turn back to a private placement later, you have to kind of reestablish that there was, you've, you've been with this customer for a little while. The way we implement that at Realty Mobile is kind of a cooling off period. There's been some SEC no action letters that recommend that you, once someone first signs up on your site, you wait a little while before you rush to take their money. Kind of just make sure that people aren't being rushed to the door of having their, their money taken. Just establish a little bit of a relationship, continue the phone calls, you know, make sure people know each other after, you know, three or four weeks, then go. So we've instituted a pretty bright line, 21-day cooling-off period, which I think is in line with what Richard said before. Um, 
but as from a marketing standpoint, it's horrible. People <laughs> register on your site, and all of a sudden, what, what? I, I'm trying to look at something. There's nothing to see. So all we can do is kind of, we establish a drip email campaign. Every couple of days, there's some more information that comes out, linking people to our blogs, or showing them some white papers that we've developed to keep their interest going until that 21 days is finally up, at which point salespeople are on the phone to them immediately. Oh, I see your 21 day period is up. Glad to have you aboard, and things go on as normal. But the, the, the conflict, as Jonathan was mentioning before, between legal and marketing generally, where we're kind of the anti-marketing, really kind of hits its apex there. It's, it's not a great user experience. So we try to do the best we can with it. But I think the, the rationale, the underlying theory behind the cooling off, this, uh, this notion of establishing a pre-existing relationship, doesn't really exist in the crowdfunding forum or the internet uh, arena where people are coming to you, just signing up on the site, and they're not really, it's not the same as, you know, getting handshakes from your attorney and your registered investment advisor to be introduced to someone. They're just coming to you, and they want to invest, and, or at least be able to see things. So I think that's an area where we hear from our own sources that have contacts with the SEC that the, the SEC is at least looking at this and whether it really makes sense anymore in this day and age or in the crowdfunding context anyway. Well, I gotta say, I hate the notion that as lawyers we're anti-marketers, but <laughs> I understand the reality. Yeah. Sounds like Rick, you wanted to yeah, let me, let me, uh, add something as well. There's a and then, movement, then we'll, and then we'll throw it up open to questions. Yeah, there's for a, a movement throughout the country to circumvent equity crowdfunding and the lack of the SEC operating. There are many states that have already passed their own crowdfunding statutes. Georgia, Indiana is about to do one. Texas is about to do one. Washington has done one. California has introduced it. California actually many years ago came out with a 25102 and exemption that basically said you could raise up five million dollars by using advertising in a tombstone on steroids type of thing and you can go to suitable investors somebody who had a hundred thousand dollars income two hundred fifty thousand dollars net worth or five hundred thousand dollars net worth and that was california a couple decades well, maybe 15 years ago that came out with that and that was the first form of crowdfunding in a state but california has also come up with something that would come under Rule 504, which is a million dollar offering. And they've basically set the same type of parameters as equity crowdfunding has been in Title III. Uh, this has gone through the Senate Appropriations Committee, and it's very close to being enacted. It's gone through the, ha the Assembly and the Senate, and it's just awaiting a full vote. Um, and I think this is gonna pass. So California is gonna be there doing their own crowdfunding within the state. But under 504, you could see several states starting to adopt under this 504, which is a federal exemption of a million, up to a million dollars, and you amalgamate enough of those together, you might circumvent or these SEC rules or make the SEC rule faster because they would preempt the field. So I see it going that way. The other comment I have, and I know we got just two couple minutes. The other comment I have is a lot of people have said, why do we have to go to a, this accreditation when you're dealing with accredited investors? Why are you making it more difficult than when you deal with non-accredited investors who self-accredit or self make themselves suitable? Why are you doing that? And there's been a movement to say, look, we don't need to do that with accredited investors. So it's, there's a movement to try to lax those requirements of accreditation. 